The Life of Percy Jackson from Percy Jackson Perseus Percy Jackson is the 18-year-old Greek demigod son of Poseidon and Sally Jackson. He's the main protagonist and narrator of the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series, and one of the main characters of the Heroes of Olympus series. He's the head counselor of Poseidon's cabin at Camp Half-Blood and a former praetor of the 12th Legion at Camp Jupiter, formerly belonging to the Legion's 5th cohort. He was also the temporary host of the Egyptian goddess Nekbet. Percy is currently the boyfriend of Annabeth Chase. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, only 25% of our viewers are subscribed, so if you're a fan of the video, please like and double check if you're subscribed. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Early Life Perseus Percy Jackson was born on August 18th to Poseidon, the Greek god of the seas, storms, earthquakes, and the creator of horses, and Sally Jackson, a mortal who could see through the mist. 18 years ago. He was named after the famous Greek hero Perseus by his mother for good luck because his namesake was one of the few heroes who had a happy ending and died a peaceful death. When Percy was still an infant, his father Poseidon left, as is usual of the gods, leaving Sally to raise Percy on her own. In Percy's case, Poseidon left to protect him and his mother from Zeus, who would have been angered to discover that his brother broke the oath, a pact made by Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, also known as the Big Three, to avoid having any more demigod children. As the most powerful Olympians, children of the Big Three wield incredible power and are seen as too dangerous to be brought into existence. Percy was left with vague memories of his father looking over him in his cradle, only remembering a warm smile, a hand on his head, and a golden glow. Hello. At some point as an infant, Percy was attacked by a snake but managed to strangle it to death, just like that famous Roman demigod Hercules. As Percy grew older, his mother would tell him that his father had been lost at sea, never confirming whether he was dead or alive. Meeting Gabe Sometime while Percy was a toddler, Sally married Gabe Ugliano and hoped that his horrible smell would mask her son from the monsters that would hunt him. Monsters are attracted to the scent of demigods. The more powerful the demigod, the stronger the scent. With Percy being a son of one of the big three, Percy's scent would be even stronger than other demigods. However, Percy despised Gabe, as Gabe would frequently bully Percy and abuse his mother. Percy nicknamed him Smelly Gabe since he smelled like moldy garlic pizza wrapped in gym shorts. Gabe spent much of his time playing poker with his friends. Early Expulsion Strange things often happened around Percy, such as school buses exploding and aquariums flooding, which often resulted in him getting into trouble. He was kicked out of more than six schools over the course of six years. This unfortunately made Percy stand out. Many people bullied him during his childhood, while others, such as his second stepfather, Paul Bloffus, suspected that something was wrong with Percy and that he couldn't be normal. It's said in the Blood of Olympus that Percy had been kicked out of several military academies where they believed that paddling is good for the soul. When he was in third grade, a man in a black trench coat followed Percy around while he was at school. After teachers threatened to call the police, the man left. However, nobody believed Percy when he said that the man had just one big eye. They thought he was hallucinating. When he was in fourth grade on a trip to the aquarium, he accidentally hit the wrong lever on the catwalk when his school was visiting the SeaWorld Shark Pool and made his class take an unplanned swim. In the fifth grade, Percy accidentally fired a war cannon which hit the school bus when he was on a field trip at the Saratoga Battlefield. The Lightning Thief Percy is a troubled 12-year-old boy who's been expelled from every school he's ever attended. Yancey Academy is where his troubles seem to be worse than usual. He only has one friend there, Grover Underwood, who is also Percy's best friend and whom Percy often protects from bullies. Little does he know that Grover is actually a satyr in disguise sent to get Percy to Camp Half-Blood quickly. Percy also has two disorders, ADHD and dyslexia. During a field trip to a museum, Percy is annoyed by the school bully, Nancy Boba Fett bullying Grover, and in a fit of anger accidentally summons a water hand from a nearby fountain to pull her in, but he didn't know how he'd done it. Mrs. Dodds, his pre-algebra teacher, witnesses the whole scene and tells him to follow her into the museum for a talk. Suddenly, she turns into the Fury Electo and attacks him, looking like a bat with humongous fangs. Mr. Brunner, actually the centaur Chiron, another one of Percy's teachers, comes in and throws Percy a pen, actually Riptide. While mid-air, the pen transformed into the sword Riptide and Percy used it to kill Mrs. Dodds. However, when Percy returns to the bus and asks his classmates, nobody remembers Mrs. Dodds. The only person that may have remembered her was Grover, who always hesitated before he answered no. Everyone else believed their pre-algebra teacher was Mrs. Kerr instead, and they'd never met a Mrs. Dodds. 
Percy arrives back at the school and hears Grover and Mr. Brunner talking about his life being in danger and becomes very suspicious since extremely strange things have been happening lately. At the bus stop, Grover sees that the three fates are looking at Percy while knitting giant socks. Soon after, the fates snip the string of life, which makes both Grover very worried that Percy was going to die soon and Percy extremely suspicious. Later, while Grover was in the bathroom, Percy ditched Grover and went home on his own at the end of the school year, even though Grover had asked him to wait for him at the bus stop. He arrives home to his horrible stepdad Gabe Ugliano and his friends playing poker. Gabe immediately demands money for his poker game, and although Percy denies he has any, Gabe deduces that he has changed from the cab driver and forces it from him. Percy's mother arrives soon afterward and tells him that they can go to his favorite beach in Montauk for the whole weekend. Percy, happy that finally something good has happened, packs his things and leaves. During their night in Montauk, Percy had a vivid dream. The dream features two animals, a horse and a bird, attacking each other. At the same time, there's a voice that Percy describes as so deep and evil that it turned his blood to ice, egging the two animals on. Percy was awoken by pounding at his door. He and his mother are shocked to see Grover outside their cabin, without pants, which Percy recommends not to see that, coming to him and his mom telling them to leave. Percy was confused at his friend's appearance, as he was a goat from the waist down and revealed himself to be a satyr. Nevertheless, his mother took them both in Gabe's prized possession, a 1978 Camaro, and began driving at daring speeds through a blinding hurricane, and it was blasted off the road by a bolt of lightning. Grover is injured and starts asking for food deliriously. As Percy and his mom help Grover up and try to get out, they saw the Minotaur, a half-man, half-bull monster who had been chasing them. The three of them managed to dodge it by following Miss Jackson's advice to jump out of the way at the last second, but Grover was too slow, and the Minotaur injured him and got distracted by Percy's mother. The Minotaur forgot Grover, grabbed Percy's mom by her neck, and she disappeared in a golden flash of light. It's later revealed that she was captured by Hades. Percy, in a surge of new power and anger, managed to defeat the Minotaur by jumping into him, breaking off its horn, and stabbing it in the chest in a fit of rage, just like the hero Theseus had done to the monster before him. Percy dragged the unconscious Grover past a hill and then passed out himself when he reached the porch of a house. He was later cared for in the infirmary by Annabeth Chase, starting their friendship, and he woke up three days later. He learned that he was at Camp Half-Blood, a place where demigods like him were trained to survive against monsters. Percy learned that the director of the camp was the Greek wine god Dionysus, who was very unpleasant and moody. And Mr. Brunner, the former Latin teacher from Yancey Academy, was actually the hero-training centaur, half-human, half-stallion, Chiron. Shown around camp by Annabeth, his new friend and head counselor of Athena's cabin, he found out that all the campers were demigods, also known as half-bloods. He himself was a demigod, but no one knew of his divine father yet. After being shown around the camp, he temporarily resided in Hermes's cabin, where all the unclaimed demigods went since Hermes isn't picky about who he sponsors, according to Luke Castellan, the head counselor for his cabin. Luke befriended Percy and treated him with respect, though they had a bit of a rivalry after Percy beat Luke in a sword fight. Afterward, Percy encountered Clarice LaRue, counselor of Ares' cabin, who performed the initiation ceremony, which was sticking Percy's head in the girl's bathroom toilet. Her plan backfired when Percy shot water out of the toilet to blast back at Clarice and her buddies. This officially began their rivalry. Unfortunately, Annabeth was not spared. When Percy apologizes, Annabeth says she wants him on her team and capture the flag. It's revealed that she wanted Percy to distract Clarice, knowing she would want revenge. Throughout the course of this game, Percy defeated Clarice and three others single-handedly when he touched the creek, which healed his wounds from the fight and gave him a sudden burst of adrenaline. After capture the flag, a hellhound summoned from the fields of punishment came out of the forest and attacked him. Percy was nearly killed, but Chiron managed to shoot the hellhound, killing it. Clarice tried to blame Percy for summoning the hellhound, but Percy denied any knowledge of it. Percy's injury from the hellhound healed by touching water. Then, suddenly, a holographic trident floated above Percy's head, which told everyone that he was the son of Poseidon, god of the sea, therefore explaining his powers over water. As the monster was not from the forest, it meant that someone within the camp had summoned it, because nothing, including weather, could enter the camp's magic boundaries without permission. Clarice said that it was Percy who summoned it, but Chiron didn't agree, as Percy himself was attacked by the monster. It's later revealed that Luke summoned this monster from Tartarus to kill Percy. One day, Percy was offered a quest to retrieve Zeus's master bolt by Chiron. Chiron explained to Percy that Zeus lost his master bolt, and since he had a rivalry with Poseidon, he blames Percy, as Zeus suspects that Poseidon Poseidon is attempting to use his son to dethrone him because Percy was at New York, where Mount Olympus was, when the bolt was lost. 
He believed that Poseidon told Percy to get the bolt since it's against the ancient laws to steal another god's symbol of power, so he could become king of the gods. Zeus was also suspicious as Percy was in New York when the bolt disappeared. Chiron said that if Zeus doesn't get his bolt back by that summer solstice, he would begin a war with Poseidon, and that he would force the other gods to take sides and cause a civil war. Percy accepts the quest and consults the camp's oracle of Delphi in getting a prophecy. Soon after learning that the Master Bolt had been stolen, Percy embarks on a quest with his sword Anaclusmos, better known as Riptide, from Chiron, along with Grover and Annabeth. On the way, they face many monsters, the Furies, Medusa, Echidna, along with her pet slash son Chimera. Percy took Medusa's hand after he defeated her and packaged it to the gods, who weren't very pleased. After Ares offered them a mode of transportation west, they arrive in Las Vegas where they stumble upon the Lotus Hotel and Casino. They get trapped in the casino for five days, though it only seemed like a few hours, leaving them only one day to complete their quest. Then they face Procrustus and tricked him into getting stretched in his old bed before finding their way to the underworld. The trio faces Hades, the Lord of the Dead, who believes Percy stole the Master Bolt and his Helm of Darkness, which was also lost. Hades saved Percy's mother right before she died to the Minotaur, explaining the Golden Flash, but Hades also thought that Percy stole his helm, which was missing. To make things worse, Hades finds the bolt in Percy's backpack, to Percy's surprise, and demands that he hand it over and he will give Percy his mom back. Torn between saving his mom and finishing the quest, Percy finally uses Poseidon's pearls to find the missing god's items. Immediately returning from the underworld, he finds out that the war god Ares had put the Master Bolt in the bag, and had Hades' Helm of Darkness, and challenges the god to a duel for possession of the bolt and helmet, in which he wins unexpectedly due to him being close to water and Ares being too cocky. A dark force, later revealed to be Kronos, stops an infuriated Ares from killing Percy. Ares vanishes in his divine form, leaving the bolt and the helm behind. Percy gives the helm to the Furies to return to Hades, who in return sends back Sally to her apartment, and the trio goes to New York to return the bolt to Zeus. Percy gives Medusa's head to Sally, who uses it to turn Gabe into a statue which was covered as a sculpture. Percy goes back to Camp Half-Blood, where everyone at the camp congratulates him, Annabeth, and Grover, since they were the first people to return from a quest since Luke. At the end of the summer, Percy can't decide whether to stay at camp or enroll in 7th grade and live with his mom. He finally decides to go train to clear his mind, where he sees Luke training at swordplay. As they later drink coke together in the forest, Luke reveals that he was behind the theft of the bolt and the helm of darkness and vanishes. However, before he leaves, he summons a pit scorpion to kill Percy. Percy manages to kill it, but it stabs its stinger into Percy's palm. He tried to reach the camp, but collapses. However, several forest nymphs carry him, and after being fed ambrosia and nectar, Percy heals and decides to enroll in the 7th grade and come back to camp next summer. The Sea of Monsters When Percy is attacked by Lystragonian giants disguised as students at school in a game of dodgeball, when the giants start throwing cannonballs at him, Annabeth rescues him along with Tyson, one of Percy's friends at his new school who was at the school for a project. He was actually a cyclops, which explains why he was extremely big. On the way to camp in the Grey Sisters Taxi, which is a taxi business run by the Fates, Percy learns some coordinates, the coordinates on where to find the Golden Fleece, that lead to something he needs. Percy arrives at camp to find the camp under attack by a Colchis bow, but drives them back with help from Tyson who's fireproof. He later learns that Talia's pine tree is poisoned, meaning the borders are weakened, and the activities director Chiron has been blamed since he is Kronos' son. Clarice, the daughter of Ares and Percy's enemy, is assigned to a quest to go to the Sea of Monsters, using the coordinates Percy received to find and retrieve the Golden Fleece, which has healing powers for plants, animals, and humans, which they need to heal the tree. Percy and Annabeth also decide to go, but Dionysus and Tantalus, the new camp director replacing Chiron after he was fired, refused. Meanwhile, Polyphemus, a cyclops, has captured Grover on a bridal shop. Polyphemus believes that Grover is a female cyclops since he was covered with jewels and wants to marry Grover for he is wearing a bridal gown. In desperation, Grover creates an empathy link with Percy so he can call for help. With Hermes' help, Percy, Annabeth, and Tyson board the Princess Andromeda, the ship Luke and his friends are on, and escape. After escaping from Luke's ship, they fight the Hydra and defeat it with Clarice's help and get on Clarice's ship. The CSS Birmingham is a tribute to Ares and is crewed by the dead who died 
in a war. As they enter the Sea of Monsters, Clarice, Tyson, Percy, and Annabeth have to get past Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla lives on a cliff, while Charybdis lives in the middle of the entrance to the Sea of Monsters. Instead of attempting to sail in between the sisters, Clarice automatically goes for Charybdis, but Scylla appears and wreaks havoc among the crew. Tyson, a good cyclops and the half-brother of Percy, supposedly perishes in Clarice's ship after the ship got blown up due to malfunction problems leaving only Percy and Annabeth behind, including Circe's Island and the Siren's Island, and Annabeth tells Percy several stories about Talia's death which she also mentions her prophecy. When they reach Polyphemus's island, they join up with Clarice, who managed to survive the explosion, Grover, who had been captured by Polyphemus, and later Tyson, who miraculously survived thanks to Rainbow, a flying hippocampus who dragged him out of the water. They leave with the Golden Fleece after fighting Polyphemus and defeating and blinding him, which Polyphemus stole many years ago. When they return to the mortal world, they send off Clarice on an airplane to the camp alone to drape the fleece on the tree. And Luke kidnaps Percy, Annabeth, and Tyson, but Percy reveals Chiron's innocence in a secret Iris message sent to camp, which Dionysus responds to by sending Tantalus to the underworld once more and restoring Chiron's job. Percy challenges Luke to a duel, but unfortunately due to Percy being out of practice and Luke being fully trained and experienced, he soon finds himself to be no match for Luke's polished swordsmanship and is swiftly defeated and very nearly killed. However, Chiron comes to his rescue with his strangely dressed relatives and they manage to chase off Luke and his allies. When they return to camp, the fleece is placed on the tree, which not only revives it, but also brings Talia back to her full life form. This revival was actually Kronos' plan, done so so that he would have another chance to manipulate the prophecy that governs the future of Olympus and the Olympians. The Titan's Curse Talia Grace, Percy, and Annabeth heard from Grover that two half-blood siblings, Bianca and Nico D'Angelo, had been found in a middle school. The three immediately set out to find them. Grover had been waiting for their appearance. He explained that he found the two half-bloods and that they were enjoying a function in the gym. He was very nervous and embarrassed as the only person he could dance with was Annabeth, who had recently grown taller than him, so he looked quite stupid dancing with her. Percy, having been forced to dance to blend in with the crowd, sees the two half-bloods following Dr. Thorne, a manticore, which was not a very good sign. Percy felt disgusted by the fact that Thalia was always powerful and a hero at everything she'd done, and so thought now it was his time to shine and ran to save the D'Angelo's from danger alone, though his plan did not work out as he planned, and he, Grover, and Annabeth were nearly killed by Dr. Thorne. Then Artemis and her hunters appear, and Annabeth falls from a cliff as she had climbed on Dr. Thorne with her knife before the hunters shot him down with their arrows. Being a son of Poseidon, Percy did not feel Annabeth dropping into the water, which confirms the fact that she had been captured. The hunters saved Percy and his friends from the manticore. After a while, Percy clearly understood that he and Thalia were not under speaking terms, due to the fact that Annabeth had fallen down the cliff. Nico had taken a great interest in the fact that he was a demigod and exchanged many thoughts on the Greek gods. Well, Bianca had been dumbfounded and was summoned by Artemis with Percy, where Bianca pledged her life to Artemis, much to Percy's protests, to become a hunter. Unaware at the time that she was a daughter of Hades, and by joining the hunters, she removed herself as a possible subject of the Great Prophecy. Artemis then sends her hunters to Camp Half-Blood with Apollo, her twin brother. When he got to camp, Percy had frequent dreams about Annabeth, and also that she was in distress. He even went to see the Oracle of Delphi, however, she didn't answer his questions, and he left the attic in anger. After a few days, the camp had a capture the flag game where the hunters were up against the campers. Thalia and Percy agreed to be co-captains of the demigod team, while Zoe Nightshade leads the hunters. During the game, he learned from Grover that Zoe had a bad dream about Artemis being in trouble, while Percy himself had a dream that Annabeth was suffering under the weight of some unseen object, later revealed to be the sky. Thalia told Percy to stay on defense to guard the flag, but when he saw that her team was about to be attacked, he ran up the middle and took the flag. On his way back, he saw Zoe running back with his team's flag and was tripped up by an arrow two feet from the line, allowing the hunters to win. Dahlia then runs up to Percy, asking him what he was thinking as when she got to the flag's spot, it was gone. She then shocks him with electrokinesis, but claims it was an accident and apologizes. Percy, angry, uses the creek water to splash her and claims that that was also an accident. Thalia and Percy begin to fight, each one summoning stronger attacks until Percy stopped, seeing the oracle walking towards them. Percy simply watched as the oracle approached Zoe, who asked about saving Artemis. The oracle replied with a prophecy, saying, Five shall go west to the goddess in chains. One shall be lost in the land without rain. 
The Bane of Olympus shows the trail, campers and hunters combined prevail. The Titan's curse must one withstand, and one shall perish by a parent's hand. Chiron then holds a meeting to decide who will go on the quest. Zoe originally wanted to take all hunters, but she's convinced to allow a few campers as well as it was in the prophecy. Zoe, however, doesn't pick Percy because he's a boy, as Zoe thinks it's horrible to be with a boy, instead picking Thalia and Grover, as well as her own hunters, Bianca D'Angelo and Phoebe. Percy was mad that he was not allowed to take part in the quest since it was his chance to save Annabeth. That night, he's awoken by Blackjack, a pegasus who tells him a sea creature is in trouble. He swims out and finds the sea cow trapped in a net and frees it slowly because it was scared of its sword, forcing him to do it by hand. On his way back to camp, he sees Nico spying on the Artemis cabin and uses Annabeth's cap to follow him. Percy overheard Zoe telling Bianca that Phoebe had been poisoned by centaur blood on a shirt that Connor and Travis Stoll had given her earlier as revenge for defeating them during Capture the Flag so she couldn't go. Revealing himself to Nico, he's forced to promise Nico that he'll watch out for his sister after Nico correctly guesses that Percy will follow the group on their quest. Nico leaves and Percy has just enough time to turn invisible before the hunters leave the cabin, with Zoe almost bumping into Percy on her way out. As they leave, Percy followed him from above on his Pegasus Blackjack. They followed the car that the four traveled in and stops hours later when the group arrives at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Percy then spots Dr. Thorne, the Manticore, and overhears him saying that Annabeth is alive and that his dreams were true. He follows the Manticore when it doesn't follow the group into the museum. He soon finds the General and Luke and sees the General creating several Spartoi that he was going to use to kill him and Bianca. However, the Spartoi got a hold of parts of Percy's sleeve instead of the General's piece of cloth with the Hunter's scent on it, resulting in them hunting him instead. Percy quickly escapes using Annabeth's Yankee cap to find the others. Zoe, in particular, was surprised and angry when they realized that he had followed them and they were soon attacked by a Nemean lion and the Spartoi close behind. After finding the lion's weakness, Percy helps defeat it by filling the monster's mouth with astronaut food he found in the gift shop. This made the monster expose its mouth long enough for Zoe to finish it off with an arrow. The lion left behind a spoil of war, its pelt, which Zoe gave to Percy as he had come up with the plan even though she dealt the finishing arrow. She also allowed him to join the quest after realizing that he is the fifth quest member, despite the fact that the Spartoi, now disguised as Grey Security Men thanks to the Mist, are tracking him. They fled Washington and made it to a train line where they jumped into a rail car with a homeless man who offered them his fire. Though at first oblivious to the identity of this homeless man, a very bad haiku reveals him to be Apollo. He asked Percy to save his sister by looking for Nereus, the old man of the sea, as he could tell him where to find Artemis. Later that night, Percy has a dream where, unbeknownst to him, he is Hercules, and is being handed Anaclusmos by a girl who he later realizes is Zoe. Apollo takes him as far west as he could, to the last stop in a small town in New Mexico. Despite there being no real way out of the town, he tried to think of ways to leave, including renting a cab. However, the skeleton warriors manage to find them again and attack with handguns while Grover passes out as Pan's presence overcomes him. As they try to defend themselves against the undead soldiers who would reform when killed, Grover senses Pan's presence again, along with a gift from the wild, the Arimanthian boar. However, because it's wild, it attacks everyone, not only defeating the skeleton warriors. Anthalia and Percy leave it into the woods. They're cornered at a cliff and he tells Thalia to jump at the last second. Thalia, however, is scared of heights, which Percy quickly figured out and pushed her out of the way, causing the boar to crash into the snow. Grover manages to use his nature magic to make an apple appear in front of the monster's face and the group rides it into a junkyard in Gila Craw, Arizona, owned by Hephaestus. They camp there for the night, but a limo appears and Percy's blood began to boil, which meant Ares was nearby. The god of war came out of the car and told Percy to get aside as someone wanted to talk to him. Percy reluctantly does so and finds Aphrodite inside. She asks him to hold a mirror as she fixes some microscopic flaws on her face. As Percy watches her, she seems to change into all the girls he ever had a crush on. Aphrodite begins to talk about tragic love stories and eventually asked Percy why he was on the quest. He originally told her it was to save Artemis, but with some pushing by the love goddess, he admits that he's really there to save Annabeth. Aphrodite is thrilled at his response and tells him that she will make his love life very interesting, hinting that Annabeth and Percy will most likely have a romantic future together. She then sends him back to his friends and warns him not to take anything from her husband's junkyard. While passing through, Bianca took a mythomagic game piece of Hades for her brother, Nico, because it was the only one that Nico didn't have. 
Because of this slight mistake, a defective automaton came to life and started attacking the group. Percy notices a manhole cover at the bottom of the machine's foot and was planning to enter it. However, Bianca went instead, sacrificing herself to kill the monster and save her friends. Percy and everyone else tried saving her, but they knew that it was completely useless as Grover announces tearfully that the next line of the prophecy has been fulfilled. Thalia takes a truck and drives them to a river where they rent a few canoes and Percy convinces a few naiads to steer them to the Hoover Dam. When the naiads start messing with him and Zoe, she tells him that they have never forgiven her. When they near the dam, Percy along with Thalia and Grover begins sprouting facts about the dam, indicating the depth of their relationship with Annabeth as the Hoover Dam was one of her personal favorites. They also make damn jokes about the damn snack bar and the damn restroom, though Zoe was lost on the humor. As they go to get food, Percy hears the sound of a sea creature he had befriended earlier. He tells it to go away and wonders how it followed him, but he's distracted by the sight of the remaining skeleton warriors. Bianca had managed to kill one in New Mexico. He runs into an elevator to escape, but then becomes trapped deep inside the dam. A tour guide, who turns out to be Athena, Percy later realizes it was her since she had Annabeth's eyes, and that she was trying to help him save her daughter, tells him that there is always a way out for those that are smart enough to find them before ascending the elevator. He's spooked when a girl appears behind him and swings at her with Riptide, but the sword simply passes through her as she is a regular mortal. She then reveals she isn't so regular as she sees these skeleton warriors for what they truly are and directs them away from Percy who hid in a bathroom. As he thanks her, he introduces himself as Percy and that he has to go, which Rachel thinks means his name is Percy Gotta Go. Up top, he warns the others of the danger and they're concerned at the top of the dam. He tells Thalia to pray to her father, but she doesn't think he'll answer. He says that Athena thinks he will and Thalia asks her father for help. Two statues come to life and swat the undead skeletons away before flying the group to California. There, Zoe Nightshade, who knows a lot about Nereus, tells Percy to look for him by smell as it's different. Percy finds him and hangs on for dear life as the old man tried to shake him off. Percy tricks him into going into the sea, which makes Percy stronger. Nereus changes into many animals to shake Percy off, but his attempts fail as he eventually agreed to answer the question. Percy asked what the terrible monster that Artemis was hunting was, which Nereus says is easy, and points to the water before escaping. Percy feels tricked until Bessie, the sea creature that had been following him, appears in the water. Grover understands it and they quickly learn it is the Ophiotarus, the monster Artemis has been seeking as burning its entrails will give the person who does so the power to destroy Olympus. Just then, Dr. Thorne appears with a small force of mortals and attacks the group, wanting to make his own place in the Titan army. He tried to convince Thalia to slay and burn the Ophiotarus so that she could destroy Olympus, but Percy manages to shake her out of her stupor. While they were cornered, Percy sends an Iris message to Camp Half-Blood, but finds only Dionysus on the other line. Mr. D makes Percy ask him politely for help, which Percy does between clenched teeth, and then the god saves them by wrapping the manticore and his men in grapevines, saving their lives. Percy then reluctantly thanks Dionysus. He then sacrifices the Nemean lion's pelt to Poseidon to ensure safe passage for Grover and Bessie back to Camp Half-Blood. Percy then goes to see Annabeth's father, Frederick Chase, as he may have a car that they could use to save his daughter. After meeting Annabeth's family, he's shocked that they're so different than the way that Annabeth had described them, as to him, they only seem caring and loving. Mr. Chase wants to save his daughter personally, but is told that it's too dangerous for him, being just a regular mortal. He reluctantly agrees and gives them his car. Before they leave, Percy makes a promise to Miss Chase to tell Annabeth that she still has a home there with him. As they drive up the mountain towards the Garden of the Hesperides, the car explodes due to a lightning bolt that struck it, forcing them to complete the rest of the climb on foot. When they reach the garden, Percy and Thalia find out that Zoe is a Hesperide after meeting her sisters, and she's poisoned by the dragon laid on, but manages to distract it, clearing a path for the others. Then they continue on to the place where Atlas held up the sky, though they find Artemis holding that burden instead. Percy finds Annabeth bound and gagged by Luke and the general, who is actually Atlas. Percy challenged Atlas, but his sword becomes too heavy, as Ares' curse finally took hold. Ares promised that his sword would fail him when he needed it most, and Percy won against him before. They were thrown into battle where Luke and Thalia fight each other, while Percy tries his best to hold off Atlas. In the ensuing fight, Percy saw the ruins of Mount Orthus, the rival capital of Mount Olympus and home of the Titans, rebuilding itself. He realizes that this meant that the Titans' chances of victory are increasing. Zoe then intervenes, fighting her father, disappointed with what her father had done. Percy used that moment to ask Artemis to give him the sky as he realized that the prophecy involved him and that only Artemis could have a chance against Atlas. He took it while Zoe and Artemis 
attacked Atlas together, but Zoe is hit and thrown against the wall, speeding up the poisoning done by Ladon, which begins to kill her. Artemis managed to push him back under the sky while Percy rolled out of the way. Sadly, Zoe began to die as Percy ran up to her during her last moments. She tells him that he is nothing like Hercules who had betrayed her before and she's proud he carries the weapon she made before dying. Percy rescued Annabeth and they managed to escape the mountain, thanks in part to Frederick Chase shooting the monsters on his plane using Celeste LeBron's bullets. He, along with Annabeth and Thalia, go back to Mount Olympus on Blackjack and his friends, Guido and Porkpie. While flying, Percy and Thalia believe that Luke is dead as Thalia had thrown him down a deep chasm, but Annabeth believes otherwise. Percy becomes slightly jealous of the affection Annabeth was showing for Luke, which surprised surprises him because it has never really bothered him before now. When they arrive on Mount Olympus, the winter solstice meeting had already begun and they begged Zeus to believe that Kronos was indeed rising. Thalia then chose to be a lieutenant with Artemis to replace Zoe before giving Percy a hug. When he said she wasn't allowed to do that anymore as hunters can't become attached to males, she said she was merely honoring a friend. The gods then voted if they should kill Percy as he is the only known child of the big three to reach 16th for the great prophecy in two years. Fortunately, many of the gods voted to let him live after Artemis declared that if he was killed, then the gods are no better than the Titans. Poseidon also vouches to let the Ophiodorus live, although kept in Mount Olympus so he couldn't be a bargaining chip against the other gods. Before Percy leaves Olympus, Poseidon tells Percy in private that he has done well and he's proud of him. Percy and Annabeth go off to resume their unfinished dance from Westover Hall. Back at camp, Percy tells Nico that his sister had died and gives him the mythomagic figure of Hades that Bianca meant to give to Nico. Nico. However, Nico blames Percy for not protecting her and throws the figurine away, telling him he hates Percy. At that moment, four of the Spartoi appear, somehow managing to get past camp borders. Nico thinks that they're here for him and unintentionally splits the earth to swallow them and send them to the underworld before fleeing into the forest. Percy, realizing that Nico is a child of Hades after the incident, tries finding him but to no avail. While discussing Nico's abilities with Annabeth, Grover appears, claiming that he'd heard Pan's voice in his head. The three of them promise to keep it a secret as Percy knows that Nico could also be a child of the Great Prophecy, but instead says that he himself will take the responsibility of the prophecy instead. The Battle of the Labyrinth Percy thinks that freshman orientation won't be fun, so his mother shows him the bright sides. Tomorrow you're off to camp. After orientation, you've got your date. Orientation turns out to be hosted by M. Pousset. When he's accompanied by a mortal acquaintance, Rachel Elizabeth Dare, which Percy thought lived at Hoover Dam, who he met at Hoover Dam in the Titan's Curse, she tells Percy to leave the room when she spots the demon cheerleaders that Percy had encountered when he went in through the side of the building to ignore Rachel. As Percy leaves, he ends up having to fight the M. Pousset and runs into Annabeth along the way. They were supposed to see a movie together, but Annabeth is upset when she sees Rachel with him because she is jealous to see Percy hanging out with her when they were clearly supposed to be at the theaters. Annabeth takes Percy to Camp Half-Blood, a camp just for demigods like them. Percy finds his half-brother slash Cyclops Tyson cleaning their cabin. Quintus, actually Daedalus in disguise, the new swordsman, is accompanied by Miss O'Leary, a hellhound that develops a soft spot for Percy. During a game that Quintus made up, Annabeth and Percy go through the rocks of Zeus's fist and fall in a dark cavern, which they later find out is an entrance to the labyrinth. Annabeth is offered the quest she's been waiting for since age 7. She must enter the labyrinth, find Daedalus and get Ariadne's string before their arch enemy Luke Castellan does. Luke has been planning on burning down Camp Half-Blood and is trying to use the labyrinth to get there, guided by Ariadne's string. As Annabeth goes inside to get her prophecy, Percy waited outside and felt a little worried when Annabeth didn't come back for a long time. When she returns, Annabeth begins to tell everyone what the Oracle had told her, but she doesn't say the last line saying she doesn't remember. This strikes Percy as strange. Why would she forget something so important? He begins to wonder what the last line could be. Annabeth takes Percy, Grover, and Tyson along with her. Together they enter the maze. They're joined by Hera for a short time. She tells him that Percy knows the way, but Percy doesn't know what she means by that. When they take a wrong turn throughout the maze, they run into Nico, son of Hades, at the Triple G Ranch. Nico is accompanied by Minos's ghost, who tries to convince Nico that they're not his friends. Once they get out without Nico, Percy and the others run into a quiz show run by a sphinx. After they escape from the sphinx, they find an exit that takes them to Hephaestus, who has them travel to one of his forges to find out who's been using them. In return, he'll help them find Daedalus. Percy gets lost in the inner depths of Mount St. Helens while battling fierce Telekines. Before parting with Annabeth, she kisses him for luck. 
Percy faces four full-grown telekines. They attempt to burn him with lava, but Percy, being a son of Poseidon, is hard to burn. In desperation, he unleashes an incredible amount of power and blasts out of Mount St. Helens, creating an explosion that damages the volcano, stirs Typhon from his sleep, and causes the evacuation of hundreds of thousands of people living around it. He ends up falling into Ogygia, where he meets Calypso, a young girl whom Percy thinks is much prettier than Aphrodite herself. Percy must leave the island and Calypso, who's fallen in love with him, behind. Calypso lets him use a magic raft that will take him to any place he wants, and the only place he can think of is Camp Half-Blood. He returns to the shores of the camp and finds the camp strangely empty, except for the amphitheater where everyone was gathered. As it turns out, they were getting ready to burn his shroud. Annabeth took to the stage to say her final words, stating he was probably the bravest friend I ever had. He Then she suddenly saw him and starts hugging him fiercely, until she realizes she was making a big scene in front of all the other campers. As they talk about plans to navigate the labyrinth, Percy realized he knew the answer after talking with Hephaestus on Ogigia. They need a mortal with clear sight to guide them. Once they're accompanied by Rachel, they run into a wide arena, where Percy battles a Dracone and the demigod Ethan Nakamura. Sparing Ethan, Percy challenges his giant half-brother Antaeus, the arena master that is accompanying Luke so that Luke's army can pass. Percy kills him by luring him off the ground, as his mother is Gaia, meaning he's invincible on the ground. When he finds Annabeth and Rachel again, Rachel leads them straight to Daedalus' workshop, who tells them that he is Daedalus and the name of Quintus was only a cover. He also reveals that they are too late. Luke got there first and took Ariadne's string. He says that Rachel is better and more accurate than the string. Monsters then attack the workshop, dragging in Nico in chains. Percy, Rachel, Annabeth, and Nico escape and leave Daedalus and Miss O'Leary to fight the remaining monsters. Monsters. They find another entrance and enter the maze once again. Once they navigate through the maze, Percy hears the Titan Lord speak to him. Taking Annabeth's invisibility cap, he goes into the room and opens the coffin. There, not fully formed, is Luke. As much as Percy hated him, Percy did not draw Riptide. He finds the demigod whom he spared earlier in the maze, Ethan. Ethan joins the Titan's side and Kronos comes to life in Luke's body. Percy barely escapes thanks to Nico and Rachel who had hit Kronos in the eye with a blue plastic hairbrush. While they were going through the labyrinth, they meet up with Tyson and Grover again. Together they all find Pan, the god of the wild, who tells them he's dying. As his spirit dies, it goes into the mouths of each of them except Nico, and it seems that Grover got a bit more than the rest. Rachel leads them to New York, where Pegasi take Percy, Annabeth, Grover, Nico, and reluctantly Tyson. The five of them had to leave Rachel behind because she's fully human. They go to help the camp ready for the Titan army's arrival. Battling side by side are Annabeth and Percy. Percy and Annabeth fight Campe along with Briare's help. Grover, in a panic, screams so loudly that it scares the Titan army back into the labyrinth. Grover's dryad girlfriend, Juniper, insists that it was Pan's wild scream that had scared the Titan army the first time. As Percy gets up, Daedalus comes and tells them that the labyrinth is tied to his life. The child of Athena, Daedalus, dies, and so does the labyrinth. Percy, Annabeth, and the other uninjured campers take the wounded to the big house. Percy decides to leave camp and go celebrate his birthday with his mom. Two surprising visitors stop by while Percy, Tyson, his mom, and Paul Blofus, Percy's mom's new boyfriend and fiancé, are celebrating. First, Percy's father Poseidon comes in and tells him that he fears Luke slash Kronos is only temporarily defeated, and when Percy blew up Mount St. Helens, Typhon stirred in his sleep. Finally departing with Poseidon, Percy decides to go to his room and plant the garden he had earlier promised Calypso. As he does, Nico stops by and tells him that he needs to tell Percy things about how they might be able to stop the Titan army. Percy then invites him for cake and ice cream. Percy Jackson and the Stolen Chariot Percy is in school when he hears strange noises and spots Clarice LaRue outside. Clarice is being attacked by arrow-throwing birds. Percy gets himself excused from class and goes to help Clarice and find out why she's there. Clarice is surprised and not very happy to see him. After the two of them have defeated the birds, Clarice reluctantly agrees to tell Percy why she's not at Camp Half-Blood. Clarice reveals that she's suspended to be taking care of Ares' war chariot and needs to get it back to Ares' temple by sundown. However, her immortal brothers, Deimos and Phobos, gods of terror and fear respectively, have stolen the chariot. Phobos comes down to taunt Clarice, who gives them a hint about where to find the chariot. Together, Percy and Clarice must go find the chariot at the Staten Island Zoo. On their way, they encounter Deimos, who is riding a sea 
sea serpent, but they quickly defeat both the minor god and the sea monster and continue on their way. At the zoo, they find the chariot and face the two minor gods again. Phobos and Deimos show Percy and Clarice their worst fears, which are Camp Half-Blood and his friends in flames and Ares respectively. By overcoming the illusions, however, Percy and Clarice easily defeat the two minor gods. It turns out that they're both extremely weak in battle without their powers of fear and terror. Finally, just as the sunset is fading, Percy and Clarice bring the chariot to Ares' temple on the Intrepid, an aircraft carrier. Percy promises Clarice that he will not tell anybody about her worst fear. He also tells her that in the vision that Phobos showed him of what he feared most, Clarice was included as one of Percy's friends. Percy Jackson and the Bronze Dragon Percy and Charles Beckendorf are on the same team for Capture the Flag, and the two war god cabins and the Aphrodite cabin are on the other. Beckendorf, a son of Hephaestus, has a somewhat awkward conversation about girls, as he has a not-so-secret crush on Selina Beauregard for three years, and thinks that Percy should ask out Annabeth Chase to the fireworks. They set off into the woods and stumble upon a huge Myrmikis anthill. Selina and Annabeth capture Percy, while Beckendorf charges straight ahead into the ant swarm as he tries to take back a huge bronze dragon's head, but immediately is bit in the leg and has acid spat in his face. Percy, Annabeth, and Selina want to rescue him, but they will need help, and so they take the metal head along to try to find the rest of the body of the bronze dragon, which was once one of the camp's defenses against monsters. They finally get the monster started, a dragon with no wings, which is an automaton, and get it to help Beckendorf. It blasts open the ants' nests, and the ants all attack the dragon. Meanwhile, Percy, Annabeth, and Selina dart in the ant hill through tunnels and chambers full of weapons, armor, and jewelry, and all manner of other magic items as they find and get Beckendorf back out. Beckendorf saves the bronze dragon from being ripped apart by thousands of Myrmikis by activating its ultimate defense system, which causes the dragon to blast arcs of blue electricity from all over its body. After the demigods finish watching the dragon drive the remaining Myrmikis back into their anthill, the dragon spots them and turns berserk on them. Percy distracts the dragon until Beckendorf could jump on the dragon's back and temporarily deactivates it. Selina is very relieved that Beckendorf is alive, and when he asks her to the fireworks, she gladly accepts the invitation. Once they get back to camp, it turns out the Capture the Flag game has not ended yet, and Annabeth puts them in Capture the Flag jail. Percy and Beckendorf protest, but they wouldn't listen and get ready to go back to the game. Before Annabeth goes goes back to the front line to fight for her team, she asks Percy out to the 4th of July fireworks, the biggest dating event of the summer at Camp Half-Blood, but she quickly leaves before Percy could answer. Percy and Beckendorf share a few lines about girls, and it's revealed that the girls' team won the game before the story ends. Percy Jackson and the Sword of Hades Persephone was called by tricking all three children of the Big Three, Percy, Thalia, and Nico, into coming into the underworld to retrieve Hades' new sword from a demigod spy who stole it. The problem is that Hades' keys are in it, which lets anyone out or into the underworld. Persephone gives them a magical carnation to track the half-blood, and when all the petals fall off, it would mean that the sword has made it out of the underworld. Percy, Nico, and Thalia must retrieve the sword before time runs out. At first, Thalia refuses to help because the forging of the weapon is illegal. All the other gods, especially Zeus, must know it first and agree to its creation. The creation of a new weapon or symbol destroys the balance between the gods' powers, but the danger that the weapon implies can free the souls from the underworld, so she figured she must help catch the thief. They catch the thief after interrogating Sisyphus, fighting and killing a group of violent Kerez, and crossing Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, after which they have a run-in with Melanoe, the goddess of ghosts, who takes the forms of Maria D'Angelo and Beryl Grace. The demigod thief is, as they suspected, Ethan Nakamura, but all the petals fall off the carnation because Ethan has raised the titan Iapetus from Tartarus. When Percy fights against Iapetus, he flings him into the river Lethe, thus causing the titan to lose all of his memories. Percy also falls in, but he stays dry because of his powers, being the son of Poseidon. Percy tells Iapetus that he is his friend Bob, and Iapetus believes him, becoming harmless as a result. Nico then has the Furies carry them and Iapetus back to Hades' palace. When they return to Hades and Persephone with the sword, something goes wrong. Hades is very unhappy about the sword's creation and leaves in anger, threatening Persephone never to disobey him again. They later find out that Persephone requested the sword against Hades' orders to tip the power of the Big Three into her husband's favor, and that she had tricked them. Percy and Thalia return to the world above, but Nico stays behind to find Iapetus a job in the underworld, and to work with his father on a plan to help the Olympians fight the Titans. Nico also reminds Percy of their plan that they had discussed at the end of the Battle of the Labyrinth, though Percy is still ambivalent. The Last Olympian 
Percy is driving Paul Blofus's Prius with Rachel Elizabeth Dare while on a quick vacation to the South Shore. Rachel is flirting her way into a relationship. Percy describes that he felt like one of Apollo's sacred crows. Slow, dumb, and bright red. They're soon interrupted by Charles Beckendorf and Blackjack landing on the hood of the car. Rachel briefly kisses Percy and Beckendorf makes a joke about not telling Annabeth about that little scene. Percy responds by saying, oh gods, don't even think about it. Then Beckendorf tells Percy that it's time to initiate their plan to destroy Princess Andromeda, Luke's demon cruise ship inhabited by Kronos' army. While they're setting the bombs to blow up the ship, some telekinesis attack. Percy distracts them to give Beckendorf time to arm the explosives. He battles Kronos, but Beckendorf is already captured. Because the explosives have no timer and Beckendorf has the detonator in his watch, he sacrifices himself to help Percy escape and carry out the plan, and Percy jumps off the side of the ship and he loses consciousness. In the water, he drifts to Poseidon's palace under the sea where he meets Tyson and his other relatives. Poseidon is fighting Oceanus and his army, aging rapidly due to the state of his kingdom being destroyed. Percy wants to stay and fight, but he must return to Camp Half-Blood to relay the news of what happened on the Princess Andromeda to the campers. Chiron and Annabeth agree to show him the Great Prophecy, and after reading it, he learns that his fate is to make an important choice and to have his soul reaped by a cursed blade. This is how the Great Prophecy goes. A son of the three eldest gods shall reach sixteen against all odds, and see the world in endless sleep, the hero's soul, a cursed blade shall reap. A single choice shall end his days, Olympus to preserve or raise. Percy's all keyed up for a while afterward until a confrontation with Annabeth when she calls him out as a coward. As he contemplates his fate, Nico returns to discuss the secret plan introduced in the Battle of the Labyrinth. He wants Percy to bathe in the River Styx to become invulnerable like the hero Achilles. To do so, Percy must first discover how Luke could do it and they go to visit his mother. Mother, May Castellan in Connecticut, where they find her insane and unstable. She does tell them that Luke came and asked for her blessing for something that he needed to do. They also meet the goddess of the hearth, Hestia, who shows Percy visions of the destruction being caused by Typhon. Percy and Nico visit Sally and Paul back in the city to get her blessing. She insists that Percy is now his own person and that she has to let him go. Nico leads Percy to the underworld where Hades reveals that it was all a trick to make Nico the child of prophecy. Nico rescues Percy, though he seems to have lost his trust, and takes him to the sticks, where he's submerged in the water and becomes invulnerable, but for one tiny spot on his lower back. The war begins, and Percy leads the group of demigods into a dormant Manhattan to battle monsters and demons, while gods are battling the monstrous Typhon in the east. Rachel arrives, revealing that she has had a vision that reads, Perseus, you are not the hero. It will affect what you do. Ethan, who was aiming at Percy's Achilles spot during a battle to invade New York, nearly killed Percy, but Annabeth had pushed herself in the way as she had a feeling that Percy was in danger, so she got injured instead. Percy is furious and horrified, knocking Ethan unconscious with his sword. Kronos threatens Percy to surrender or he'll kill Annabeth, but Percy calls Blackjack, who takes her to a hotel in a plaza. Annabeth is seriously injured, and Percy tells her where his Achilles spot is and that she saved his life. Annabeth remarks that he looks cute when worried and that his eyebrows get all scrunched up. When Kronos makes it to the Hall of the God, Percy battles him to stop the destruction of the Olympians' thrones, which, if destroyed, will cause the Olympians to lose their power. Kronos asks Ethan to kill Percy as he knows where his Achilles spot is. However, Percy convinces him that what he's doing is wrong. Ethan then attacks Kronos and strikes him on the shoulder with his blade. However, due to Kronos also bearing the curse of Achilles, Ethan's blade cracks and he harms himself fatally. Kronos then opens up a fissure which causes Ethan to fall to his death for his betrayal. Annabeth is able to convince Luke to resurface. She reminds him of his promise that he would protect her and asks Percy to give him the knife so he can defeat Kronos. Percy hands over the knife, discovering that he was not the hero after all, but his choice to give it to Luke was the decision he had to make, and it decided the fate of Olympus. Kronos is blown to dust and scattered by the wind, and Luke dies a hero's death. Right after that, the gods arrived after successfully defeating Typhon and are shocked to see Luke's dead body on the ground. Through deaths and betrayals, the demigods stand victorious. Percy is offered the gift of becoming a god, but he he declines due to his feelings for Annabeth. He remembers how he felt when Annabeth might have become a hunter of Artemis and notices Annabeth looks about the same way that he did then. Because of this, he declines their offer in favor of a request. He requests that the gods claim their children by the age of 13, and that Camp Half-Blood construct cabins for Hades and the minor gods so their children will have a place at camp. When he comes back to Camp Half-Blood, he finally expresses his feelings for Annabeth and they kiss twice. The first time in Camp Half-Blood's mess hall, and the second time 
being underwater, due to which a group of eavesdroppers tosses them into a lake, the latter which he describes as pretty much the best underwater kiss of all time. At the very end of the book, he and Annabeth share a moment of bliss as they race toward the road down Half-Blood Hill back to the mortal world, not looking back at Camp Half-Blood for once. Percy Jackson and the Singer of Apollo. Percy celebrates Grover's birthday party alongside Juniper and other triads at Prospect Park in Brooklyn. After gifting Grover aluminum cans, the satyrs suggest playing pin the tail on the human, frightening the only human present, Percy. Before the game could begin, Apollo arrives and greets Percy and Grover. They attempt to tell him that they're taking a day off to celebrate Grover's birthday, but Apollo interprets this as a day off to help him. Apollo takes Percy and Grover to the side in order to introduce them to the Celadons, a trio of golden automatons who sing in beautiful harmony and will perform with the god in a concert of Olympus. Grover protests that they sound fine, but Apollo reveals that the Celadons are a quartet and one had gone rogue after Hephaestus' 2,000 year warranty expired. Percy complains that Apollo could retrieve the Celadon himself, but he explains that he needs to perform a sound check for the concert and that the heroes are supposed to run the gods' errands. He suggests that the two search at the theater district of Manhattan, as Celadons are always looking to be discovered. Grover realizes that a Celadon singing in public could create mass panic, causing Percy to agree to the quest, but asks why he picked the two to complete the quest. Apollo reveals he likes Percy, and that his experience with the sirens during the Sea of Monsters is a similar challenge. He summons his personal lyre and tells Grover that his immunity to magical music and the ability to play the lyre's magic will aid in the capture of the Celadon. He sets the rendezvous at the Empire. Empire State Building by sunset before vanishing. Percy and Grover, who doesn't bother to disguise himself, take the subway to Times Square, as it's located in the middle of the theater district and filled with tourists and Broadway performers. While searching, Grover bumps into a hot dog vendor cart and clutches the lyre protectively. Percy questions the use of the lyre, but Grover explains that if the right song was played, it could create anything. Percy expresses doubt as Grover's skills on the reed pipes waver between days. The satyr spots the Celadon approaching a mic on an outdoor stage and it prepares to sing, causing Percy to stuff wax in his ears. He explains the difficulty in fighting automatons with mortals and manipulates the mist to show a presidential motorcade to the cops in order to block off the area. As the police block off the exit, Percy uncaps Riptide and attacks. However, the Celadon's song resonates through the earwax and causes mortals to weep with depression. Grover frantically imagines a cage around the Celadon while playing the lyre, but instead summons a brick wall between Percy and the Celadon. The momentum causes Percy to crash into the wall and topple it over the Celadon, who regains her composure and begins singing a song about Apollo and the Sun. Percy begins wrestling the automaton, but notices that the heat resonating from the song has melted his earwax and singed his shirt. Grover attempts to think of a cage for the Celadon, but random shifts occur to him being nervous. With no other choice, Percy swings Riptide, forcing the Celadon to stop singing and transform into a quail who flies to the top of Time's Tower. Percy and Grover ride the elevator to the top of the tower and climb stairs to reach the roof. They spot the Celadon serenading Times Square with New York, New York. Percy thinks of shoving her off the roof, but reminds himself that she would transform into a bird, causing an idea to form in his head, and he asks Grover if he can use the lyre to summon a birdcage. Grover protests that birds should be free, but realizes Percy's plan and promises to try. Capping Riptide, Percy asks Grover for the blindfold he was going to use on Pin the Tail on the Human and approaches the Celadon. As she finishes singing her song, Percy jumps on her back and gags the Celadon as Grover strums the lyre for a birdcage. The Celadon attempts to throw Percy off the roof of Time's Tower while Grover nervously tries to think of lyrics. A birdcage of celestial bronze begins to form, but the Celadon spins Percy off her and pushes him off the tower. A metal rung catches his pants belt, but the momentum causes Percy to slip out of his pants and continue falling. The demigod snares onto a billboard to prevent himself from falling and reveals that he wears plain blue boxers, claiming they're more comfortable than briefs. The Celadon smiles down at Percy and begins singing about Percy letting go of the billboard and falling. Percy wills himself not to listen and thinks of Annabeth and his saving her from the sirens. He imagines her anger and resolves that it's scarier than monsters, breaking the automaton's spell. Percy realizes that the Celadon would only transform into a bird if she was startled and uses the empathy link to tell Grover his plan. He asks the automaton for an autograph and Grover tells her to check his pants for a pen. The Celadon complies and uncaps it only to be startled by the appearance of Riptide. She transforms into a bird, but Grover grabs her and shoves her inside of the birdcage. He laments that he scratched Apollo's lyre and imprisoned a bird, deeming it to be the worst birthday ever. 
Percy reminds Grover of his situation, and the satyr, now focused as the Celadon is imprisoned, plays a tune that summons a rope for Percy. Upon noticing the sun starting to set, Percy states that they have to meet Apollo at the Empire State Building, but Grover suggests for him to put his pants back on. They arrive at the lobby where Apollo literally brightens upon seeing them. He exclaims that he'll have Hephaestus fix the Celadon, but notices the liar's scratch. Percy intervenes and tells him to have that fixed as well, causing Apollo to lighten up. He invites the two to watch his concert, but Percy lies, claiming they're not worthy of his music and might explode. Apollo buys the excuse and leaves with the Celadons for his concert in a flash of light. Grover suggests picking up Juniper at Prospect Park to attend the sing-along and eat s'mores at Camp Half-Blood. Percy winces at the mention of the sing-along, but agrees to go for the s'mores, claiming that they may still have time to turn Grover's birthday around the staff of Hermes. While celebrating their one month anniversary, Annabeth asks Percy what he had planned for their special dinner that night. Percy, who never remembered promising something like that, stalls for time just as Hermes arrives. Percy takes Hermes into his truck to talk, where the god reveals that while he was delivering packages to Janus, Kaku snuck into his truck and stole his caduceus. Because Hermes doesn't want to be seen looking for it, as the other gods would never let him live it down, he sends Annabeth and Percy to find it for him. Annabeth takes out her video shield, and at first, when she said, let me see Kakus, the shield shows her the city of Sikakus, New Jersey. After she rewords the sentence, they find the giant is in the meatpacking district. When Percy and Annabeth get there, they climb down a ladder into the sewers and find an underground cavern. There they meet Kakus, and he tries to sell them watches and clothes, which Annabeth quickly notes are fake. When Percy asks for the caduceus back, Kakus claims he'll figure out how it works and become the god of traveling salesmen, mostly by forcing George and Martha to listen to him. Annabeth and Percy go on the attack, with Annabeth stabbing him in the back of the knee and Percy stabbing his leg. However, Kakus backs her and Percy into a corner, destroys Annabeth's shield, and is about to turn into stone when George and Martha turn into a cell phone. They escape the cavern when Percy calls thousands of gallons of New York sewage to him, and it pushes them to the surface. Annabeth then comes up with a plan and runs to a crane, knowing how to operate it as she had observed them on Olympus. Percy lures Kakus under the crane's large hook, and Annabeth drops it on his head before picking him up and swinging him into the air where Percy destroys him with the Caduceus's laser mode. Percy and Annabeth then return the Caduceus to Hermes, who is very grateful. When questioned what other enemies the gods have and what exactly Zeus has been threatening, Hermes dodges the question. As a reward, however, Hermes transports them to Paris for special dinner gourmet foods. Their night ends with Percy and Annabeth walking by the river and Annabeth wondering what Percy has planned for their two-month anniversary, which makes Percy happy that she sees a future for them in a month. The Lost Hero. Even though Percy does not appear in this book, it's revealed that he and Annabeth are officially dating and that the whole of Camp Half-Blood was extremely worried about him. For most of the book, his location was unknown, with the only clue being that he disappeared around the same time that Jason Grace, a son of Jupiter, first physically appeared. It's eventually revealed that Jason and Percy were exchanged by Hera and Juno to unite the demigods of Greece and Rome against Gaia and the Gigantes, as well as other creatures. Son of Magic Alabaster C. Torrington mentions the son of Poseidon while telling Dr. Howard Claymore of Cronus' defeat. The son of Hecate states that if he ever encountered Percy, he would give him what he deserved. The son of Neptune Percy Jackson is being attacked by the Gorgons, Stheno, and Euryale, intent on avenging their sister Medusa's death. The sisters seemingly could not be killed as they reform every two hours due to Thanatos being captured while none of their attacks wound Percy because of the curse of Achilles. He had been running from them for three days ever since they saw him. He had woken up at the wolf house having no idea who he was or how he got there and wondering why the Gorgons can't kill him, and met Lupa two months before the encounter with the Gorgons. The only thing he remembers is a dim memory of Annabeth. He believes what Lupa and the Gorgon sisters have told him about himself, that he is Percy Jackson, a demigod, the son of a barnacle-encrusted god from 5,000 years ago, who is Poseidon, whom they only know as Neptune. Percy then knocks out Stheno and then uses her tray to slide down a hill. He meets up with June, a goddess disguised as an old lady, and she gives him a choice. Carry her to the other side of the road, or leave everything and go to the ocean, creating a new and invincible life for himself. Percy chooses to carry June to the camp, even though it means he'll lose the curse of Achilles. After reaching the borders of the camp, he uses water from a nearby river to create two giant hands that destroy the sisters, as the water breaks their connection to the earth. The waters of the river seem to have also washed away his curse of Achilles, as after the waters receded, Percy felt like he had been in an acid bath, and he felt vulnerable. Just then, Percy is met by many demigod children, including Frank Zhang, Hazel Levesque, and Reina Alvia Ramirez Arellano. 
who has met Percy before. June introduces him as a son of Neptune, and Reyna seems to know Percy somehow when she hears his name, which confuses him. June then shows her true form as Juno, and the campers bow in respect, except for Percy, who thinks that because he carried her all this way, he didn't feel like she deserved his respect. And also because Percy didn't particularly like Juno in her Greek form Hera, though he didn't remember that at the time. Reyna then orders Hazel to take him inside where she could question him. During their conversation, Percy noticed that Reyna had feelings for Jason Grace, and considered him to be more than just a co-worker. When the conversation's over, Reyna believes that Percy is telling the truth about losing his memories and lets him go. Percy then meets Octavian in the Temple of Jupiter, and then meets Nico D'Angelo, who he does not remember, but he does think that he knows him from somewhere. From then on, he's initiated into the Roman camp, where he impresses some of the campers with his battle prowess during that night's war games, managing to help the fifth cohort win their first war games in a long time. At the end of the game, Mars himself appears and selects Frank, his son, and Percy for the quest to free death. Percy vaguely remembers his antagonism towards his Greek counterpart, Ares. He somewhat visualizes that they had a fight in the past. They embark upon their quest using the only vessel in the Roman navy, a pathetic rowboat called the Pax. They sail to Upper California where they meet Iris and see the giant's army. They then move to Portland where they encounter Ella and the wicked king and seer, Phineas, who also appears to have knowledge of the past, present, and future, although he's blind. Ella was wanted by Phineas as he thought she was a very precious harpy because of her knowledge. His intentions were to tie her up and keep her like that, but the three friends find it cruel and make a bet with Phineas. They find the location of Thanatos when Percy gambles with Phineas using poison and healing Gorgon blood. By tricking him with Gaia's help, Percy's able to take the healing vial. From then on, his memories begin to return. They eventually reach Seattle and the Amazon Company, which is run by Gila, Reyna's sister, and also the former secretary of Circe. After escaping the Amazon compound with great difficulty, the group fled to Frank's house in Canada where his grandmother lived, who unfortunately had an appointment with death as the house burst into flames. She had told Frank that he was a descendant of Neptune and he could turn into anything. This had a great effect on Hazel as she was told by Pluto that she would be freed from her curse, blackouts about her past whenever she thought about them, and finding cursed jewels wherever she was by a descendant of Neptune. She had thought it was Percy, but now she had no idea who would free her. Hazel had also kissed Percy on the cheek for his moral support. From there, they went to Alaska as more of Percy's memories returned. Upon arriving on the Hubbard Glacier, Frank was able to free Thanatos by burning a piece of wood which contained Frank's life. When the wood burned out, Frank would die, but only after Frank played a big role. He had entrusted his life with Hazel. Meanwhile, Percy fought off a legion of Roman undead warriors, using his powers to create a hurricane and a massive tidal wave. When Hazel, Frank, and Orion tried to kill Alcyonius, Percy thrust Riptide into the glacier. This caused several fissures to materialize, culminating in Percy and the undead soldiers falling from the glacier into the sea below. After Frank and Hazel killed Alcyonius, they retrieved Percy, who had the Roman standard, and was waiting on a block of ice for them to return. Percy eventually saves Camp Jupiter from Polybates' attack and is raised on a shield to become a praetor. The following day, Percy tells the senators that he is Greek and a warship is arriving with their former praetor, Jason. Percy tells the Romans not to attack and Reyna eventually agrees to his request. The Senate meeting ends and Reyna confides to Percy that she hopes Jason is on the warship. Reyna also said she missed Jason Grace. Percy then wraps his arms around Hazel and Frank and wants to introduce them to his other family, the Mark of Athena. At the beginning of the book, Percy is spotted walking with Hazel and Frank as the Argo II arrives at Camp Jupiter. Annabeth improvises a plan to appease the Roman god of borders, Terminus, and allow them to enter Camp Jupiter. Camp Jupiter Praetor Reyna, on advice from Percy, allows Annabeth, Piper, and Jason to descend from their ship to have a meeting in the camp's borders. Discussion over the Prophecy of Seven appears to go well, and Reyna is on the verge of agreeing to cooperate. However, Leo, possessed by an Eidolon, uses the Argo II's ballistics to fire at Camp Jupiter, causing a fight to break out between the two camps. Camps. Jason, Annabeth, Percy, Hazel, Frank, and Piper escape to their ship with the Romans hot on their trail. They begin their journey to the ancient lands, making a few necessary stops and visits to certain gods in the US before they can leave. After many obstacles, they get to Rome. In Rome, many more monsters attack, with the worst yet to come. When the demigods of Camp Jupiter realize that Rome was their destination, they resolve to instead go to war with Camp Half-Blood, and they march towards New York. This, however, isn't their only problem. Annabeth, assigned a mission from her mother Athena to recover the Athena Parthenos, must go her own way, and thus Percy becomes extremely worried. Furthermore, he still has to face his own problems, including drowning. After he battled the twin giants, Otis and Ephialtes, 
succeeding by working together with Jason and Bacchus, the Roman form of Dionysus, Percy goes on to help Annabeth, even though the child of Athena must go alone. Though he finds her in a workable situation, that quickly changes, and Percy and Annabeth go down to the stables to catch up. Guarding the Athena Parthenos was Arachne, who Annabeth tricked into trapping herself. As Arachne falls into the abyss of Tartarus, she and the Athena Parthenos were over the void of Tartarus, she shot out her silk spider webs, one of which wrapped around Annabeth's ankle. Annabeth gets dragged towards Tartarus and Percy desperately holds onto her. As a result, Percy and Annabeth both fall into the dark abyss, clinging on to each other. The House of Hades Percy and Annabeth have been falling for supposedly nine days into Tartarus. They see the ground and a river rushing up to them, which Percy uses to catch them in their fall. The river was the River Cocytus, the River of Lamentation. It gave the two thoughts of giving up and drowning, but Annabeth manages to get them to the shore. The air in Tartarus is poisonous, and according to Annabeth, smells and tastes like styrofoam peanuts, which Percy remarks smells like his stinky ex-stepfather, Gabe Ugliano. To enable them to survive the horrors of Tartarus, Percy and Annabeth drink from the Flaming River, the River Phlegathon, which allows monsters to endure the punishments in Tartarus. After drinking from it, Percy and Annabeth feel much better and are able to journey throughout. They come across many various reformed monsters and titans, such as Hyperion, and to their surprise, an old friend of Percy comes to help, the good-turned titan Iapetus. Iapetus, known as Bob, helps them on their quest, and allows them to find and close the doors of death. However, along the way, complications start to unfold as Bob starts to remember who he is. As they pass a golden bubble, in it the reformed Hyperion, Percy asks Bob to burst his golden bubble since Bob is the only one with a weapon. They then come across the R.I. Percy pleads with Bob for help, but Bob hesitates and allows him and Annabeth to get hurt because he realized that they were the ones who wiped his past memories. Seeing Annabeth in deep despair and blindness, Percy has no choice but to battle the R.I., resulting in him getting the curse of slowly dissolving. This stretches back to the previous book, The Son of Neptune, where Percy had a bet with Phineas, resulting in Percy surviving after he prayed to Gaia. Phineas then cursed Percy to die a painful death through dissolving. However, Bob finally decides to help after seeing who his true friends were. Together with Annabeth, he takes Percy into the giant Damasin's hut to get him healed. With that, Percy is restored to his original health and the trio continue on their journey to the Doors of Death. Percy and Annabeth use the Mansion of the Night to reach the Doors of Death. However, they're soon faced with great difficulty as the Death Mist fades and they can be seen by the hordes of monsters present at the Doors of Death. On top of that, the primordial of the pit, Tartarus, also takes on a physical form and begins his attack on them. Percy intends to battle Tartarus, but is stopped by Annabeth, who feels that Tartarus is way too powerful and is in a class by himself. Bob and Damasin both agree with Annabeth. With much reluctance, Percy gets into the elevator with Annabeth and journeys back to the mortal world, with a promise he makes to Bob to say hello to the stars for him. Percy and Annabeth meet the five other demigods in Epirus, and back on the Argo 2, he fulfills his promise to Bob by looking into the starry sky and saying Bob says hello, before the Argo 2 continues sailing in the night. The Blood of Olympus just a few days after his return from Tartarus, he asked Jason to protect Annabeth for him while she was accompanying him to Ithaca, since he was staying behind to watch threats from the sea. Jason squeezed his shoulder and promised she would return safely. Two days later, Percy met the Seven for breakfast to discuss subduing Nike while eating blue waffles, sitting next to Annabeth who chided him for using too much syrup. Percy was okay with fighting Nike and suggested that the combinations of the demigods that went to fight her would spark Greco-Roman rivalry. Percy agreed not to go with Jason since they might kill each other and agreed to go with Hazel, Frank, and Leo. Percy and Leo scouted the museum and then sat on a bridge overlooking the Cladeos River, skipping rocks. Leo was very intimidated by Percy after surviving Tartarus, his reputation at Camp Half-Blood, and his relationship with Calypso. Percy realized that Leo was mad at him and tried to discuss it, but they were interrupted by Frank and Hazel. The four walked around the ruins of Olympia and stopped at the Temple of Zeus, after Leo realized Nike was probably there. Percy suggested promoting Adidas shoes to make Nike angry enough to show up, but he and Leo began insulting Nike, causing her to show up instead. After Nike split into Nike and Victoria, they decided to have Percy and Leo fight Frank and Hazel. Percy suggested fighting Nike instead, but she refused, saying that if they don't want to fight each other, she'll persuade them. The Nikai forced them into the arena and they discussed a plan to defeat them. Percy was against fighting and Hazel using the labyrinth, but he reluctantly agreed. After five minutes, the fighting began and Percy pretended to fight Frank and Hazel. He fired popcorn grenades and as Nike taunted him, he wanted to drown her in a river. 
He managed to cut a Nightcat in half, making Nike angry. He and Leo escaped by jumping behind a wall, and he finally decided to talk about Calypso. He apologized for failing Calypso and said he knew about her and Leo. He explained that he was reminded in Tartarus about not following through with his promise to her and assumed the gods would free her, and between everything that happened in the series, he forgot about her. He then said he was glad Leo found her and if they survive, he would do anything to help him. Leo was shocked and exclaimed that he can't hate him for being perfect and apologizing, making Percy smile. Suddenly, Percy heard Hazel in pain and ran to help her. He then fought a Nightcat who almost killed him, but Leo saved him. After their victory, Percy was okay but sore and bruised. He then discovered that one of the seven would die. A few days later, the Argo 2 arrived in Pylos. The seven discussed what to do after Piper and Frank returned from getting the mint, and Percy suggested setting Leo on fire after they heard about a statue. He then suggested for the ship to fly instead of using the sea to avoid a nearby sea serpent. The next morning, Piper recounted her dream about the giants to Percy, and he became so scared the plumbing exploded, which scared her. He insisted that Annabeth and Piper cannot face Mimas and Makai alone, wanting to go with, but Annabeth was against it since they may use his blood to summon the giants. Annabeth kissed him and then left. On July 27th, there is a huge storm harming the ship, and Percy stood at the masts, keeping the Argo 2 from being capsized or destroyed. Jason went towards Percy, appreciating that he wasn't trying to protect him or force him to return to the sick bay. Percy told him something was causing the storm and wanted him to go underwater with him, though he couldn't breathe underwater. Percy jumped overboard and Jason followed, using a bubble of wind around him to give him oxygen to breathe. Percy greeted him and the boys followed a green light further underwater. They arrived at a palace and Jason suggested it was Atlantis, but he said it was a myth. Jason pointed out that they deal with myths and that he could see why Annabeth was the brains of the operation and he told Jason to shut up. They were suddenly greeted by Kaima Palia, who said that she was Percy's sister and wanted to see him die. The three talked, and Kaim was offended when he didn't recognize her. Percy asked her to stop the storm, but she refused. He was also happy when he found out she was married to Briaris, and asked if she was around. Suddenly, Polybides recognized Percy and vowed to crush him once and for all. Serpents lunged to attack him, who sliced them in half as Jason tried to reason with Chimapalia. Basilisks then closed in on Percy, who tried to push them away, but they kept circling. After Jason saved him, he drew his sword and ran to face Polybides. But the giant created a pool of black, oily poison, which Percy ran into without hesitation. Percy began choking on the poison and dropped Riptide, falling to the floor as a weighted net dropped over him. Jason urged Polybides to free him, but he laughed, saying Percy would die very slowly, wanting to see him suffer. Percy's face turned green as he writhed in the net, and Jason ran to help him, but he was blocked by the giant. Eventually, Jason saved his life by agreeing to honor Chimapalia and all the minor gods. And so, the two killed Polybides and freed Percy. Jason cut him out of the net and put him in his oxygen bubble to expel the poison. He thanked Jason, though he was cross-eyed and fuzzy and immediately threw up. After the ordeal, Percy bid his goodbye to Kaimapalia and told her Briares was a good man and to give him a chance, but she refused. She also told him the gods will want his blood and that he has yet to face his fatal flaw, being unable to step away. She said that he would face a sacrifice he's unwilling to make and it would cost him the world. He insisted he would not run when his friends needed him. She then told him the forces of the ocean were fighting for him and they may not survive. After he left with Jason, Percy was still woozy from the poison, so he sat on a ledge to catch his breath. He thanked Jason for saving his life and had him promise not to tell Annabeth or anyone else. He then began to confide in Jason about his trauma in Tartarus. He said that when he was choking on the poison, he thought about Achilles, and when he poisoned her, how it felt good and how he would have killed her if Annabeth didn't stop him. When he was being poisoned by Polybides, he thought he deserved it for what he did to her and the fates would just let him die, which was why he didn't try to control the poison or get away from it. Jason understood him and the two changed the subject, discussing how Uranos was defeated and how it could help them defeat Gaia. They also discussed Jason's plan to honor the gods. Jason complimented Percy on how he turned down his immortality, saying it was noble and wondered how he did it. Percy joked that sometimes he regretted the choice. Percy was later proud of Jason when his wound was healed. Over the next few days, the Argo 2 was damaged from the storm, and Percy and Jason had to push it away from a rock. They eventually arrived in Mykonos, where he scouted with Annabeth and got gelato for everyone. He joked about seeing pelicans everywhere and sitting at bars. He also advised Frank, Leo, and Hazel not to mention haikus when seeing Apollo. The next day, Percy discussed the house of Asclepius with the Seven and received the nickname Aquaman from Leo. Percy wished him, Piper, and Jason good luck before throwing up. He ate dinner with everyone that night. The next morning, Piper, Annabeth, and Percy saw snake people who he suspected to be Draconae, but he realized they were different since they looked more human. He welcomed them aboard the ship, and one snake man introduced himself as Kekrops, the first king of Athens. When he explained that he was a Geminus, 
Percy thought it was like a zodiac sign and said that he was a Leo, but Leo corrected him. He was a Leo, Percy was a Percy. Hazel chided them and called them idiots. The group discussed Octavian with the giants, and as Kikrop said, he was their best bet to make it to the Acropolis. Percy pointed out it might be a trap. After Piper charm spoke the king, he revealed his plans, and Percy decided to go with Annabeth underground with Piper, since his scent would be difficult to discern. Percy shook Jason's hand and bid him goodbye until they meet again at the Acropolis. The four walked underground, and he held Annabeth's hand. Percy was creeped out by underground, comparing Gaia's heartbeat to Tartarus. Kekrop scouted the territory, and Percy sat down with the girls. He talked about his mom and how he hasn't spoken to her since Alaska, and almost started crying when he mentioned how she and Paul Blafus are all he has. Annabeth quickly corrected him and said that he had Tyson and Grover as well. Percy also found out that Annabeth had family in Boston and was surprised since she was a Yankees fan. They soon kept walking and he saw the place where Poseidon and Athena started their rivalry. He touched the scars of his father's trident and then pulled Annabeth close, kissing her for a long time. When he pulled away, he said the rivalry ended here and proclaimed his love for her. Percy apologized to Piper for making things awkward, but she didn't mind. Soon after, Hazel used the mist to turn Percy and the others into Earthborns. He joked that he was glad he kissed Annabeth before they turned into monsters. They arrived at the Acropolis, and Percy scouted the middle, but he was captured by Enceladus. He and Annabeth struggled as they were brought to Porphyrion, who proclaimed them as the blood of Olympus. Percy tried to defend himself by using a geyser of water, but to no avail. Piper saved him from Enceladus when she stabbed him in the forehead, distracting him enough to drop him. Percy was able to grab Porphyrion's spear and stab it into the ground, making him fall over. He then tried to get a sword out of his hair, but he swatted Percy into a column like a pesky fly. He managed to get up, but he was dazed and couldn't defend himself. Eventually, after the others arrived, he faced Thune, but couldn't realize that his nose was bleeding. Piper tried to warn him, but his blood spilled and Gaia woke. But suddenly, all of the Olympians and some of the other gods arrived due to the Athena Parthenos being returned. So Percy fought alongside Poseidon to defeat Otis and Ephialtes. After the victory, Percy gathered to discuss Gaia with the Seven and the gods. He complained about his nosebleed that woke Gaia, but Athena told him not to blame himself. He also explained to Leo that Gaia can pop up wherever she wants. Percy and the Seven, except Leo, were herded into the Argo too, which was catapulted to camp by Zeus. Frank shapeshifted into an eagle and carried Annabeth and he who hated flying. He then rallied the Greeks to charge the monsters invading the camp. After Gaia appeared, Percy yelled for Jason to wait since Frank can fly him and the others, but Jason told him to stay with camp because of the prophecy. Frank then put his hand on Percy's shoulder, agreeing with Jason and saying only Jason, Piper, and Leo can defeat Gaia. Percy didn't like it, but he joined Annabeth when she beckoned after a horde of monsters ambushed the Greek forces. After the battle was over, Percy, the remainder of the Seven, and Nico D'Angelo discussed Leo's death at the big house. Percy became angry at Hazel and Frank when he discovered that they kept Leo's plan a secret, but his anger subsided when they started crying, and agreed it was a plan Leo would have done. Though Leo's body wasn't found, he was still hopeful that the son of Hephaestus was alive, pointing out that he had always bounced back and they can take turns strangling him. A few days later, Reina Ramirez Ariano gave he and Annabeth the news that they could go to college and live out their lives in New Rome. Nico approached the two after he heard them cheer, and they told Nico the good news. Nico was happy and told him he was staying at camp, which Percy was happy to hear. Nico then decided to clear the air with Percy, since they would be seeing each other often, and said he had a crush on him, but he was over it. Percy was surprised, looking at Annabeth, then at Nico, and could barely get a word in asking for clarification. Nico reassured him that it was cool and though he was cute, he wasn't his type, and then bid the two goodbye to join Will Solace. Percy Jackson's Greek Gods Shortly after the defeat of Gaia and the Giants in the Blood of Olympus, Percy was asked by a publisher in New York to record and write down what he knows about the Olympian gods, to which the young demigod agreed, reasoning that it would help inexperienced demigods survive any unexpected divine encounters with a major Olympian. Percy proceeds to compile all of the stories that the demigods of Camp Half-Blood and Camp Jupiter told him over the years. After finishing his narration of the book, Percy mentions being late to a meeting with Annabeth, which worries him. Percy Jackson's Greek Heroes A year after finishing writing Percy Jackson's Greek Gods, Percy is approached by the same publisher who, very impressed with the last book, asked him to write one more, this time focusing more on the ancient Greek heroes. While Percy had originally refused, he was finally persuaded by an offer of a year's supply of free pepperoni pizza, along with numerous blue jelly beans. 
Percy reasoned that this book would help his fellow demigods, instructing them on how to properly defeat most of the infamous monsters that they might happen to come across. Right after finishing his narration of the book, Percy reveals that after the events of the Blood of Olympus, he and the rest of the Seven started the tradition of monthly Argo 2 reunion parties, and he's quite worried about being late to the current one. Between the series, Due to his semester-long absence, the son of Poseidon was expelled from Good High School and attended an alternative high school for his senior year where he joined the swim team. He studied hard to get his diploma. Son of Sobek A giant crocodile has been terrorizing Long Island along with other magical disturbances in the area. Percy approaches and stabs the beast in the rear with Riptide. The crocodile proceeds to spit out Carter Kane and run away. In the process, Percy's orange Camp Half-Blood t-shirt gets splattered with mud, leaving the words on it unreadable to the other boy. Much to Carter's surprise, Percy can clearly see his wand in Kopesh, which should have been impossible for a mortal. Despite meeting almost all magicians in the North American gnomes, Carter had no idea who this person is, only that everything about him seemed un-Egyptian. Percy tries to get Carter to thank him for rescuing him from the crocodile, but Carter is somewhat embarrassed and ends up angry over Percy's comments instead. The two then get into a small argument over the ownership of the monster, with Percy thinking that the monster is Carter's pet after he said it was his monster, but he only meant that he was chasing it. Percy then asks Carter if he's a son of Ares, as he must be a half-blood of some kind. He also asks why his sword is all bent, but Carter tells him it's supposed to be like that, being a Kopesh. Carter also gets angry at Percy's use of the word half-blood, as his dad is African and American and his mom is white, as well as Percy offering to help because the last time Carter was eaten by a crocodile. Carter accidentally uses the Fist of Horus to cause a fist to knock Percy right out of his shoes and into the swamp. Carter instantly rushes over, thinking he might have killed Percy, but is hit in retaliation by a huge wave of water generated by the angry demigod. Percy lunges at Carter with his sword, forcing the latter to defend himself, not able to attack due to Percy's superior skills with a sword. During the fight, Percy accuses him of being a monster, which Carter angrily denies. Percy also asks if he's an escaped spirit from the doors of death, or if the monster was his pet and Carter was just trying to find it. The fight ends when Carter uses some magic rope to tie Percy's sword to his head just as Percy hits his arm, causing Carter to bleed. During the small break, Percy comments that Carter must be a half-blood since the celestial bronze sword would have passed right through him had he been mortal. Percy also asks if he was a rogue demigod who used to be part of Kronos' army. After listening to Percy talk for a bit, Carter starts to realize that Percy isn't a magician and is something completely different, as Percy keeps using words related to Greek mythology. The two form a truce so they can go after the crocodile, as it's been terrible rising Long Island for weeks. The two also introduce each other, eventually revealing their names. They find the crocodile terrorizing a small cul-de-sac with a few kids spraying the monster with water guns and hitting with water balloons. Carter sees a gold necklace around the crocodile's neck and tells Percy they need to remove it to stop the monster as it can't be killed. Percy tells Carter to distract the crocodile so he could get to it, and Carter makes a large avatar of Horus around himself to attack the monster. Percy then jumps on the crocodile and tries to unlock the necklace, but can't as he isn't a magician. As Carter's avatar fades and the crocodile crashes into a house, Carter and Percy switch places. Percy creates a massive whirlpool in the center of the cul-de-sac using the water generated by the crocodile. The crocodile is swept up in it and Carter manages to make it to the necklace. As Percy begins to tire, Carter finally manages to remove it and the crocodile returns turns to its original form, that of a baby crocodile. Percy and Carter run off with the baby crocodile after hearing some cop cars approaching. Resting at a nearby diner, Percy and Carter watch the news, as they report that a freak sewer incident had destroyed the homes in the cul-de-sac. Carter and Percy wonder if someone's trying to bring them together to cause trouble, and agree to keep their respective worlds a secret from each other until the time is right. Carter takes the necklace and the baby crocodile with them, but places an enchantment on Percy's hand, so if he ever needs to contact him, all he has to do is say his name. The two part on good terms. The Staff of Serapis while Percy himself never actually appears in this story, he is mentioned multiple times by Annabeth, who was taking the subway to his apartment before encountering Sadie, and is implied to have gone there after her adventure. The Crown of Ptolemy Annabeth goes to Percy's apartment and tells him about a dream she had from her mother Athena, about trouble brewing in Manhattan. They take a ferry to Governor's Island, where a freak hurricane has caused all the mortals to evacuate. While they're trapped on the island surrounded by snakes, they attempt to contact Carter and Sadie Kane, but fail. Annabeth and Percy decide to face Setne, who is reading from the Book of Thoth by themselves. They make a plan to use the invisibility cap to sneak up on Setne, while Percy distracts him. Before running off to battle, Percy gives Annabeth a kiss in case they die. 
While Percy is sneaking up on Setne, he trips and falls on his butt, which makes him noticeable to the magician. Setne knows that Annabeth is using her invisibility cap and captures her, stating that he's been using invisibility magic for as long as the pyramids have existed. Setne then uses a magic spell that pins Percy to the ground. He reveals that he was watching Annabeth and Sadie while they were battling Serapis, and that it was an experiment to see the powers that Annabeth and Sadie possessed. Setne summons Wajit briefly so he can consume her essence and take the crown of Lower Egypt that she wears. Before he destroys her, he takes a selfie with her to remember the moment. Annabeth concludes that once he puts two crowns of Lower and Upper Egypt that he will destroy the world. Setne claims that he learned that a little demigod blood is good for starting a war, but Percy stops him by hitting him in the gut with Riptide. With Riptide protruding from him, he absorbs the sword's essence and learns about all of Annabeth and Percy's adventures. Suddenly, Sadie and Carter arrive and attack Setne with a camel, but he manages to escape. The squad decides to regroup and plan while heading south of the Governor's Island. Carter and Annabeth decide that they need to combine attacks to defeat Setne. Carter gives Percy his wand, turning into a coppice. In exchange, Annabeth teaches Sadie the Greek word for exploding and gives her invisibility cap to Carter. When the squad finds Setne, he's trying to summon Nekbet. They all charge, but fail at attacking him. Nekbet is successfully revived and tries to attack Setne, but Percy and Annabeth pull her away since Setne is trying to consume her essence. Setne drops the Book of Thoth, and then Carter yells, Stop! and then disappears with Nekbet's crown of Upper Egypt. Nekbet decides to stay with the four teenagers to get her crown back and help destroy Setne. She suggests that she merge with Percy since mixing Egyptian and Greek powers worked earlier. Percy reluctantly agrees to it, but only because it's the only way to defeat Setne. After merging with the goddess, they go off to find Setne again. After finding him, the quartet goes after the crown so he doesn't turn into the ground. Setne talks about Carter's dad, and Carter takes off his hat of invisibility and goes to attack Setne in his avatar form, but Setne blasts Carter to the ground. Setne then rambles on about why he wants to be immortal, including getting souvenirs after him such as snow globes. After Carter gets blasted, Percy turns into his vulture avatar form, and Sadie whispers something into Annabeth's ear. Percy grabs Setne and swoops him into the air. While in the air, Setne tells Percy he was a fool for giving up immortality. Nekbet agrees with Setne that Percy was foolish to turn down immortality, but Percy fights back, then plummeting to the ocean. Once in the ocean, Percy regains all of his strength and drops his avatar form, grabbing Setne by the throat and dragging him to the island. A newly bandaged Carter greets Percy along with Annabeth and Sadie who have drawn a circle on the ground. Percy decides to make him suffer for eternity instead of destroying him. While sealing him off, Carter thinks of Setne's snow globe idea and traps him in a snow globe. Sadie reveals that she told Annabeth her secret name earlier, but Annabeth states she's already forgetting all the magic she learned. Percy and Annabeth decide not to tell Camp Half-Blood, at least not yet. The four determine that they will remain in contact. Sadie and Carter fly off, and Percy and Annabeth go on a date afterward. Percy Jackson and the Chalice of the Gods in order to get a letter of recommendation to New Rome University, Percy agrees to find Ganymede's missing chalice. The Hidden Oracle Percy appeared when Apollo and Meg McCaffrey showed up at his apartment in need of his assistance. Percy was disgruntled and asked why they were here. Apollo introduced him to Meg and explained his situation and said that Meg must be taken to Camp Half-Blood. Percy was surprised to find out that Apollo was fully mortal and reluctantly let him and Meg inside. He let them in and told Apollo not to mention Hera when he mentioned her and told him that Sally Jackson was not cursed, she was just pregnant. Percy then introduced Apollo and Meg to his mom. After Sally suggested, Percy went to get Apollo cleaned up after noting it was depressing that they were the same size. Percy left Apollo in his bathroom and gave him some ambrosia and nectar and some clothes for him to wear. Apollo then went to talk to Percy who was sitting on his bed. Percy recalled the last time he had a nosebleed after seeing Apollo's blood on his carpet, making Apollo remember how he was turned mortal. Percy told Apollo that the last time he saw him it was August and now it was January. After Apollo said he didn't know how long he'd been out, Percy recalled how Hera wiped his memory and that he hated memory gaps. After Apollo asked Percy to help him, Percy explained that he won't turn away a demigod in need, but he he cannot get involved in another prophecy since he made promises to his mom and Annabeth Chase to stay out of trouble and to get his diploma, and he was busy catching up on his classes. He also wanted to live long enough to meet his baby sister and see his mom's novel get published. He didn't want to abandon his family like that. Percy also explained that Annabeth was in Boston for a few weeks due to a family emergency, but Percy did promise to lead Apollo and Meg to camp. Percy, Meg, and Apollo ate lunch together, and Percy complained about how he hates studying, since New Rome University required him to pass the D-Stomp test, all of his classes, and the SAT. Percy required that he would never forgive Apollo for writing a hard portion of the D-Stomp. 
Percy explained to Meg how he was a demigod and asked Apollo how he and Meg met. Their story was interrupted when Sally brought Percy lunch, and Percy agreed with Apollo that his mom was awesome. Apollo explained to Percy the two other times he was a mortal and how he was Meg's servant. The third also discussed what spirits may be following them, and Percy toyed with the possibility that Apollo may be barred from entering camp, which worried him. Percy joked with Meg about how he started his demigod career by exploding a toilet, making her giggle, but she frowned when she found out he had a girlfriend. Sally then brought them three cookies, but said that Percy cannot have any unless he comes back safely, and made him promise he'd be right back. Percy then told Apollo and Meg that a batch of cookies were at stake for him. Percy drove Meg and Apollo close to the camp from Manhattan in Sally's Prius. Percy warned Apollo not to jinx them if they were being followed, and explained to Meg that the oracle isn't working. When Apollo said he hoped demigods went on a quest to solve it by now, Percy said that without prophecies, there cannot be quests, and so they're stuck in a catch-88. Suddenly, when they saw Spirit, Percy swerved and drove through a drive through and a strip mall to get away. Percy drove through a railroad crossing and soon ended up in the countryside near camp. Percy then swerved, damaging the car. Percy, Meg, and Apollo left the car after that. Percy was upset and annoyed when he found out the monsters that were attacking them were Nosoi, and Percy said that while it seemed that he killed everything in Greek mythology, he didn't. The three fought the Nosoi, and Percy wanted to cut them up with Riptide. Percy charged into battle, but every time he defeated them, they dissolved into glittery mist, then re-solidified. Percy caused a tank to rupture to try and kill them, but it was no use. Percy soon accidentally ran into a plume of smoke the Nosoi made, and he was unable to breathe. But Percy and Apollo were saved after Meg, with the help of Peaches, defeated the Nosoi. Percy was skeptical of the Carpoi because he did not like them, but he was shocked how he liked Meg, so he trusted him. Percy was sick from the smoke and sneezed with such force that an irrigation pipe exploded behind him. Percy offered to drive them to camp, but police came to tow the Prius, and Percy stayed while he was interrogated and told the two how to get to camp. A few days later, Percy arrived at camp with Miss O'Leary to help defeat the Colossus Neronis. They landed on the statue's head, and the hellhound peed on the statue's head, startling Percy. Percy immediately asked Apollo what he did, and Apollo told him it was only partially his fault, and he was making a plan to fix it. Percy then threw a spike at the statue's head and tried to get his dog to attack it. He jumped from the statue's head to its shoulder and slid down to the ground, impressing Apollo. Percy got the statue to chase him as he ran to the beach. During the battle, when Apollo began to doubt if he could make the shot on the statue, Percy and Chiron stared at him grimly, and Percy put a hand on his shoulder, saying he was Apollo and that they need him, and if he didn't do it, they would throw him off the Empire State Building. When Apollo defeated it, Percy and Chiron ran to avoid being crushed. The next day, Apollo tried to leave camp, but Percy and Rachel Elizabeth Dare followed him and told him not to leave. Percy tried to reassure Apollo that he belonged at camp and that he was once in the same situation, but Apollo insisted that he must free the other oracles to save everyone. When Apollo said he wanted to give up looking for Meg, Percy said that he should keep looking since they'd lost too many good people, Luke Castellan, Ethan Nakamura, and even almost Nico D'Angelo. Percy said he cannot give up on Meg since they're bound together and that she's one of the good guys. After Percy heard the prophecy from the Grove of Dodona from Apollo, Percy figured out that Leo Valdez was coming back on Festus and that he would be the one to help him on his quest, making him happy and grinning. When Leo returned to camp, Percy happily reunited with him and gave him a bear hug, not punching him like the other campers, but looking disgruntled. He also had a tense reunion with Calypso, awkwardly hugging each other. Percy and Leo bonded over how they both went through the Sea of Monsters and how they both hate Polyphemus. Percy also explained to Leo and Calypso the Triumvirate Holdings and Nero, and what happened in the last six months. As they discussed, Leo mentioned how he was with sarcastic pirates on the high seas, and he and Percy high-fived. Percy left that night before dinner and said goodbye to Leo and Calypso, with he and Leo hugging and Calypso pecking Percy on the cheek. Then he and Mrs. O'Leary disappeared into the Long Island Sound. The Dark Prophecy Apollo mentioned Percy when thinking about the pros of 21st century demigods. He compliments the son of Poseidon's driving skills. Meg also mentioned that Percy taught her not to jinx her quests. The Burning Maze Grover mentions Percy wishing he were with them. Apollo also mentions constantly how handy the son of Poseidon could be on their quest. The Tyrant's Tomb Apollo mentions the son of Poseidon when entering Camp Jupiter. He later thinks of a story he heard of Percy using Dean Martin to scare away a flock of attacking Stymphalian birds, and use the same tactic on some attacking giant ravens. The Tower of Nero Having just graduated high school, he sets out west with Annabeth and Grover. After Apollo regains his godhood, he visits him and Annabeth at New Rome University where he's still struggling to figure out a major. Annabeth also seems disgusted at sharing a dorm with him. They express their sadness at Jason's death and he says he misses his mother's cooking. At that, Apollo summons a plate of blue chocolate chip cookies and in surprise, he takes back most of what he said about the sun god. The Hammer of Thor 
Percy is mentioned by Annabeth to Magnus when he asks her advice about traveling through the oceans, and she responds by saying it's time for Magnus to meet Percy Jackson, her boyfriend. The Ship of the Dead Percy and Annabeth were in Boston to help train Magnus Chase and his friend Alex Fierro for the quest to stop Naglfar from sailing. Percy quickly got along with Magnus and told him SPQR means these Romans are crazy. Percy tried to teach Magnus how to jump off a ship, handle the masts, control the ship, and try hand-to-hand -hand combat at the bottom of the ocean. It was hard for Percy to train Magnus, however, because every time he looked at him, his eye twitched, the stress of the weekend getting to him. Percy asked if Magnus was okay when Magnus tried to dive but fell on the deck instead. When Sumar Brander started talking, Magnus introduced him to Percy and Annabeth. Percy was nervous when the sword flew to him and learned that Riptide was actually a girl. Percy uncapped the pen and made it a sword so Riptide and Jack could bond with each other. Percy was shocked that she was a girl, but Alex told him to respect the gender. Percy thought it was strange that he never knew, and Annabeth teased him, saying that he didn't know the pen could write until the year before. The four of them then got lunch from Fadlin's falafel, and when Annabeth said that heroes can never be ready, they just have to try as best they can, Percy said they haven't died yet, and Annabeth said they do keep trying. Percy put his arm around her, and he kissed the curls on her head, making Magnus' heart do a twist, jealous that they would live to adulthood. Percy also said how excited he was to babysit his baby sister, Estelle Blofus, and said that she was awesome and drools a lot. Annabeth commented that she and Percy were similar because they both drooled. Percy apologized that he couldn't help Magnus more because the sea is unpredictable. Alex said that he at least felt better that time and that he could turn into a dolphin to save him, and Percy was shocked that he could do that. When Alex offered to show him, Percy said that he believed him because his friend, Frank Zhang, is a shapeshifter. Percy said that having a good team is better than having good sea skills. Percy also told Magnus advice about sea gods that would help him. They're territorial about their stuff, like Chimapalia, Poseidon, Triton, and Galatea. Percy said that Jason saved him from Chimapalia, and since Annabeth didn't know, Percy's ears turned as pink as Alex's jeans. He then said that he was looking at things all wrong. You do not need a plan, you just need to improvise. Annabeth said that as a daughter of Athena, she cannot endorse that, but Percy just said that Annabeth is crazy smart and good at improvising, and that instead of training with him, he should have trained with Annabeth instead. Annabeth agreed that that was sweet and kissed him on the cheek. Alex called him Seaweed Brain, and Percy told him not to start with the nickname too. Before he left, Percy told Alex he would quote him on what he said about flaunting the weird. Percy and Magnus shook hands before they left. The last they saw of him, Percy was driving his Prius on First Avenue, singing along to Led Zeppelin on the radio, with Annabeth laughing at his bad voice. Percy and Annabeth's future and Percy's little sister Estelle motivated Magnus to succeed on his quest. When Magnus got home, he called Percy and Annabeth, who had just arrived in New Rome. Percy told Annabeth to ask Magnus if he followed his advice on the quest, and Magnus told her to tell Percy that he kept his butt clenched like he said. Percy was upset during the phone call because of Jason's death. Un Natale mezzo sangue. Nico takes Percy to Florence after the son of Poseidon struggles with finding a gift for Annabeth. The son of Hades takes him to a store owned by Charu, the last of the Etruscan gods. After asking questions about Annabeth, he gives the son of Poseidon a bracelet of keys, and asks him to explain the meaning of Christmas. After Percy explains the universal meaning of friendship and family behind the holiday, he's given the gift and the demigods leave. The Sun and the Star, a Nico D'Angelo adventure. Percy appears to Nico in a nightmare of when Nico is trapped in the bronze jar by Otis and Ephialtes. In the dream, Percy stands at the height of a titan and, crying, tells Nico that he has to go, that we made a mistake, you have to fix it. When he and Annabeth are studying for an English test, they receive an iris message from Nico and Will, who explain their quest to go to Tartarus to save Bob. Percy and Annabeth express their guilt that they forgot about Bob. After the son of Poseidon and daughter of Athena fail to talk them out of it, they tell the sons of Hades and Apollo that their best chance at surviving Tartarus is to stick together. Hades later reveals to Nico that Percy has changed a lot of things for the gods, making them rethink their priorities, behaviors, and standards. Hades in particular was affected by Percy's actions, causing Hades to rethink sending Nico after Bob when he realized that it will put Will in danger too. Did you enjoy our video? Be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.